face of the earth is the dirtiest face you'll ever see. And no doubt you've seen quite a few dirty faces that look a lot better when the dirt's washed away. But the earth's face is pretty because it is dirty. We call dirt soil and it grows all the flowers and grass and the trees and all kinds of plants that are chewy or juicy, delicious, and good for you too. Animals feed on the plants and the animals grow. Some of them grow big and healthy. We eat what the plants and animals give us and we grow and grow and grow. Most of the time we run around hardly noticing the ground under our but no. if it weren't for the soil like these red foxes that need the plants the soil grows for food and shelter but lucky for us and wildlife too nature is busy making soil all the time from the Earth's first volcanoes and earthquakes that formed the Earth's rocky crust, through centuries of rain, cold, heat, and wind that have worn the crust into bits and moved the pieces around, layers of soil have built up year after year. Leaves die and fall. Mushroom-like fungi and other plants grow on dead things. And with the help of bacteria that live in the soil, magnified here thousands of times, the leaves rot or decay. All living things die and crumble into the soil, where trees grow tall and send out roots that do their part to break rocks into bits that add to the layers of soil. At the end of their lives, the trees too become soil. Where all kinds of wild things build tunnels and burrows, make nests, raise their young, eat, grow, and die. Their bodies decay and add to the soil. If you measured each of the things that make up good rich soil, you'd find about 25% air, 25% water, 45% minerals, and 5% plant and animal life. Of course, all these things are mixed up together in soil. What's this, a soccer field? When we're running around on top of the ground, it's hard to imagine what makes up the soil or what kind of life is going on under our feet. Layers of soil build up over hundreds or thousands of years. Different kinds of soils lie under forests, marshes, deserts, and prairies, each with its own kind of plant and animal life growing on or close to the top. If you've walked in the woods, you've probably noticed the ground is springy. Your feet bounce. Over your head, the trees spread billions of leaves that in the fall, fall and cushion the ground. Dig a hole and you can see leaf-eating millipedes and dozens of other small insects and animals in the rich, moist, airy forest soil. Millipedes were probably among the first animals to leave the ocean for land and they've hardly changed since those days. Earthworms live in many kinds of soil here in the forest and in your backyard, too, they're the Earth's plowing machines, making air tunnels in the soil as they eat as much as they weigh every day. If you had 22 feelers on the end of your nose, you might rather live your whole life underground, too. This star-nosed mole uses its strong paws and claws to dig tunnels that mice and many other small forest animals use as roadways. The little deer mouse pops in and out of the ground, forever hunting for forest nuts and seeds. What it doesn't eat right away, it puts in its underground storerooms for later snacks. Marsh soil is cool 
and wet. It oozes up through your toes like toothpaste squeezing out of a tube. We may think a marsh is all water, but it's the mucky soil under the water that grows the grasses that feed many marsh birds, insects, and other animals. This is no marsh monster, it's a young dragonfly, called a dragonfly nymph. Growing up in the marsh, it feeds on insects, worms, tadpoles, small fish, and even other dragonfly nymphs. It will shed its skin several times before it grows its four wings and can fly. What could make a snapping turtle happier than acres of cool marsh mud to wander around in? Unless maybe a snooze in the sun or a duck egg for lunch. It's from the grasses and cattails and other marsh plants that the muskrat builds its home. The muskrat even plasters its house with marsh mud. Hot, dry desert soil is about as far from marsh mud as your feet can get. It's so dry, you might not think that anything could live in it. You'd be surprised. You could meet a tarantula. Pretty hairy and scary. Actually, it's a shy sort of spider. How to attack a desert insect, but not you. In the heat of the day, it hides in the protecting sand and hunts at night when the desert is cool. A kit fox is as shy as a tarantula. Much more hairy, but not at all scary. Like most desert animals, it stays underground during the day. Its den has many tunnels and doors. At night, the fox hunts small animals that are also out looking for food. Lizards, like this Gila monster, are cold-blooded. That means their body temperature changes as the air temperature changes. When the desert sun makes them too hot for comfort, they can seek shelter in underground burrows or beneath rocks. The strawberry cactus is suited to desert life. Since the sandy soil is too loose to hold what little rainwater falls, desert plants must store water within themselves. This cactus makes fruit that tastes just like its namesake, the strawberry. Prairie soil is a rich, crumbly mixture of sand, clay, and silt. It's called loam. Step on it. It feels firm. Grasses and flowers grow thick on the prairies. And many animals, like prairie dogs, which are really squirrels and not dogs, make their homes there too. Prairie dog towns are dotted with mounds of earth where tunnels link all the neighbors. They eat the grasses and herbs that grow close to their towns and line their nesting rooms with grasses as well. Most owls live in trees, but not these. They're burrowing owls and they live in holes in prairie ground, often where larger animals have lived. The prairies that once fed great numbers of wild animals still feed bison and make a home for pronghorn antelope and other animals that need wide open spaces if they're to survive. We must keep wild places always for wild animals to make their homes. Thousands of other rich prairie acres have been put to work, raising millions of bushels of wheat, corn, and other crops. We sometimes call the prairie America's breadbasket because so much of our food comes from prairie land. But of course, farms all over the country grow all kinds of food. So that you have your pick of what you want to eat. You can bet when it tastes extra good, it grew in good soil. You can tell good, rich farming soil by the feel of it. It's not light and dry like sugar or sand, and it's not heavy and thick like cream cheese. It's moist and crumbly, more like a handful of chocolate cake. Some of our soil is not in such good shape. When there are no plants to hold dry soil together, rains make gullies and ditches. 
without anything to protect it, some soil simply washes away into muddy streams and rivers that dump the soil into bays, oceans, and lakes. That's a lot of soil gone to waste. Besides, it can clog up rivers and lakes and destroy places wildlife needs to live. This tractor is raising clouds of dust driving through dry soil. Dust stirred up by your feet or by a tractor may settle right back down. But a windstorm whirls dry, dusty soil high in the air and carries it far. Once, about 50 years ago, a long drought and high winds turned worn out farmlands in the Midwest into one giant dust bowl. Many farmers had to leave their land, so buried in dust, it couldn't grow crops anymore. The Soil Conservation Service was formed to study soil problems and help everyone, especially farmers, learn how to treat the land so that disasters like the Dust Bowl need never happen again. Farmers often plow their fields in the fall. That leaves the ground loose and bare, and the harsh winter weather can wash or blow it away. Soil conservationists advise farmers to leave their old crops, such as corn, in the ground over winter to hold the soil firm. Then, in the spring, new corn can be planted right alongside the old. The old corn both holds the soil and enriches it when it rots. The leftover stalks also give wildlife, such as these sandhill cranes, a place to pick up a bit of winter food. And other creatures, like this cottontail rabbit, place to hide. Farmers have also learned it's better to plant hilly land in curved rows, and often, as you can see by the different greens in this field, to plant more than one crop in one field. This strip planting helps keep the soil rich, and the curved rows help keep soil and seed from washing away. And a way to keep the wind from blowing the soil off is to grow trees and bushes as wind breaks or hedgerows. Besides breaking the force of the wind, hedgerows make great winter shelter for pheasants and other kinds of wildlife like songbirds, rabbits, and foxes. But it's not only farmland that needs to be saved. Where cattle are raised, we have to be careful not to let the land become overgrazed. The soil of our woods needs protection too. When roads are made through the forest and when trees are cut down, we have to make sure that we don't leave the ground open to erosion. And when we build towns and cities, which we certainly need, we have to be careful not to strip the ground of all its trees, shrubs, and grass. The soil needs plant roots to keep it from washing away. Taking care of our soil means learning to treat it like the treasure it is. Good soil means all kinds of good things, both to wildlife and us. And it's never too early, wherever we live, to start learning about the good things soil can do for each of us and things we can do to care for the soil. From watering a potted plant when the soil's dry, to keeping water from pouring off the roof of a house and carrying soil away. We take a lot from the soil, and we have to learn how to give back what we take. The next time you rake leaves, for instance, keep the leaf pile for compost to fertilize your garden next spring. And grow your own vegetables right in your hometown. If we all do our part, small, and large, to care for the good earth that nature took so many millions of years to form, the soil will grow the food the world needs for ages to come. If we care for the earth, every day can be a big thanksgiving. Thanks not just for juicy red watermelons to munch, 
but also for apple blossoms to sniff. And for all the wild animals to share the ground with us. And even for mud puddles to play in once in a while. One of the best ways to show our thanks is to hand back to the world the rich earth nature gave us in the first place. Water, it's wonderful. Water's for dashing through, cooling off in, and taking off from. It's for making puddles to ride a bike through. And water's for catching sparkles of sunlight to look at and wonder. Have you ever wondered what the world would be like without water? We wouldn't be here, that's for sure. Try to imagine a day without water to drink or to wash in, though your dog might rather stay dirty and dry. Every living thing, plant and animal, needs water to stay alive. Water has always nourished us. Dinosaurs once roamed their rich, primitive marshlands, gobbling tons of plentiful, water-grown food. Desert nomads of old and their camels depended on water holes to keep them from dying of thirst on their sea of hot sand. Water has always been useful to man. In China, the Yangtze River has long been a wet highway where boats carry people and goods for miles. Water has met other human needs, too. Through the ages, water has played a big part in different religions. Here in India, Hindu people bathe in the Ganges River to purify body and soul. Today, just as in ages past, people put water to all kinds of uses. No, this isn't a weird space creature. It's an irrigating machine watering fields for crops. I bet you'll agree. This is one of the pleasantest things water can do for us. Make a water slide slippery and fast. It's hard to imagine we could run out of water when we know that three-fourths of the surface of the Earth is wet. Water is even in places you might not expect it to be. Apples, for instance, they're so crunchy and crisp, but they're 84% water. Thump yourself on the leg. Pretty solid. Would you guess that about two-thirds of your own body is water? With water everywhere, and part of every living thing, how could we ever run out? Well, so far, in most places, there's enough water to give your flowers a drink. The big question is, will we always have enough clean water to do all the things water needs to do for the world? In power plants, thousands of gallons go through huge turbines like these to give us electricity. Millions of gallons more are used in factories and on farms. Rivers don't flow everywhere, so we try to spread water around. The Colorado River is being drawn off in so many directions, its southern end sometimes dries up before it reaches the Gulf of California. We have to remember, there's just so much water to go around. And even though nature helps water recycle itself, we have to do our part so that nature can do its job efficiently. Here's how the water cycle works, naturally. We're under a thundercloud. That means rain's on the way. Some of us don't bother to run for cover. Some of us say, who cares? Let it rain. 
Some rain falls into water. Some soaks into the ground, as if the soil were a sponge. The water seeps down, down, cleaning itself on the way of most impurities, as it trickles to underground rivers and reservoirs. Some of the purified water surfaces in a spring where a fawn might take a crystal clear drink. Springs may become streams that flow into rivers. Lakes are fed by both rivers and springs, and by rain, of course, too. Rivers run into the sea, but the water cycle doesn't end there. The water's journey, in fact, has no real end. The heat of the sun constantly draws moisture from water and land. Plants sweat. You perspire, too. All that wetness goes into the air. Up high, the water vapor drawn up by the sun cools, making clouds form. And pretty soon, up go our umbrellas. The same total amount of Earth's water goes up, down, and around year after year after year. Just think, the water you brush your teeth with today could contain a recycled drop from a dinosaur swamp. Wherever good, clean water flows, it supports life. A mountain stream is home or habitat. To a crayfish that moves forwards and backwards as it feeds on snails, the young of insects, and small fish. Many plants, insects, fish, birds, and other animals depend on the stream for food, drink, and shelter. Small minnows dart, camouflaged, through flickering shadows. A mountain bird, called an oozel or dipper, will dive straight into a rushing stream to catch water insects. Sometimes, dippers build their mossy nests behind waterfalls. Lucky for this bighorn sheep, many streams start high in the mountains, providing water for the world's best mountaineers, the bighorn. Pike, trout, and other fish abound in the streams, a great place to go fishing, with or without a canoe. When running waters find or make wide, deep channels, they become rivers, and they feed and shelter different kinds of wildlife than live in the tumbling mountain streams. In rivers, you'll find bluegill sunfish, other fish hunted by bears. This bear's eating its fish tail first. How about a wet roller coaster ride on a rubber raft? It's great to be able to share a river with wildlife. People, like otters, use rivers for play. And people, like beavers, put rivers to work. We've built thousands of dams. Dams can cause many problems. Some block salmon streams. All dams flood wildlife habitats and change the natural world. But dams are also important to us. The 44-story high Hoover Dam on the Colorado River provides electricity for part of the Southwest. The point is, when we build dams, we have to plan carefully and ask ourselves, do the good things outweigh the problems? Where shallow water covers the ground for at least part of the year, it forms marshes, bogs, small prairie ponds called potholes, and swamps. Some people think these bodies of water are useless and ought to be dug out or filled in. But wetlands, large and small, are where many water plants thrive and where thousands of freshwater animals live and breed. This bird, a green-backed heron, roosts with its kind but hunts all alone. It's about to catch something to eat, a fish or a frog, perhaps. Migrating snow geese and ducks by the thousands depend on wetlands for food and rest on their long treks north and south. Lakes form where water collects in deep bowls in the Earth's crust. The crater of a volcano or a big hollow scooped out by a glacier or a river dammed by nature or ourselves. Lakes are for loons. You see them in the summer diving into the water to catch fish. 
you may hear them scream, too. It's a loud, weird sound. Maybe like a witch. Northern lakes are for moose. This one's shedding water, the way your dog does, by shaking itself hard. Moose cows raise their young around lakes. Here's where the young learn to be the strong swimmers their parents are. At the edge of a lake, a red fox takes a long, cold drink of water. And a boy baits a hook to go fishing. Maybe there's a granddaddy bass out there, the one he missed catching last summer. A lake is even more than a wildlife habitat or a place to swim or to go fishing. Listen to a lake as it laps softly while the sun goes down on its far shore. It's as if the water is whispering, appreciate me, I'm nature's most precious gift. No wonder Indians long ago called a lake the smile of the great spirit. And no wonder people have chosen to build great cities like Chicago on lake shores, as well as on useful and beautiful rivers. It's hard to count all the ways water serves us, but water is why we live on Earth instead of the waterless moon. The moon gives us a bright, lovely glow, but the Earth's water gives us life itself. How can we possibly treat our water unkindly? Rivers and lakes aren't meant to be junkyards for shopping carts, old tires and such, or for chemicals and other poisonous stuff that may be less ugly than junk, but is far more harmful and hard to get rid of. By the year 2006, about seven billion people will be using the Earth's water supply. That's almost one and a half times as many people as live here today. Many of those seven billion will be us. We don't want things to come to this, where even a bluebird has trouble getting a drink because we're using water faster than nature can recycle it. And we can't let things reach this point where the water we do have isn't fit to be used. Right now, many people are trying to find answers to how to use water more wisely and how to keep water clean. Groups like the National Wildlife Federation are working with Congress to get new laws passed and enforced to protect our water supply and to encourage everybody to learn about water, respect water, conserve water, and to obey the water laws already passed. There is progress because many of us are working together. Today, we can boat and fish in once badly polluted rivers, lakes, and bays. But there's much more work to be done. You can help too by finding out all you can about our water supply, by thinking of ways to save water, and by understanding how much water we'll all need in future years. One of the best ways to understand the nature of water is to get to know nature firsthand. Here's a young fellow taking a very close look at water life. Nature makes beautiful sense in countless ways. When you hear water, you know you are listening to the rhythm of life. All growing things must have water. Each living thing needs wetness, sometimes to splash in or to sit in. Some days you'll do anything to get wet. We can all share our water, always if each of us makes nature's way our very own. Nature is forever telling us we're all here together, under the sun. Plants, animals, earth, air, and most important of all, wonderful, life-giving water. <laughs> 